Sweden, uh, do you know what Sweden is? Some of you are nodding, maybe some not. Okay, so it's the National Center for Applied AI here in Sweden. And I'm leading something we call the Natural Language Understanding Initiative, uh, which we sort of started a year ago. And the only reason why we started that is we want to build large scale, what's called language models for the Swedish language. Uh, and we're building currently something we call GPT SWE, which is what I will be presenting and talking about. And I will talk about why we do it and what it is, and hopefully what's it, uh, what it's good for also. Um, I know at least one of you know what a language model is. Do, do the rest of you, have you heard uh, language models? Yeah, some of you know. Yeah, so it's basically just a statistical model that learns a probability distribution over language. And we train a language model by simple next step prediction tasks. So we feed it the input sequence of text and then we ask the model to continue that sequence. Or we blank out some words in the input sequence and ask the model to fill in the blanks. And if you do that a number of times, a huge number of times, the model will learn a probability distribution over the language that you feed it with. So why do we want to do that? Well, we can utilize that probability distribution to solve basically any type of language processing task. So it's, it's sort of a generic um, language understanding representation. Um, I, I put all in parentheses because at this point we don't really know uh, if all language tasks are applicable to language models. Uh, some of us believe so, but uh, I'm going to be conservative and say maybe it's applicable to everything that we want to solve. Um, so, so the way that we use language models is we train a language model and I'm going to show you how big they are soon. Uh, that's called pre-training. And when we have trained a model, that's uh, typically open sourced and available for everyone to use. So you can download uh, a language model and then use specialized language model to solve some specific task that you might be interested in, like named entity recognition or question answering or translation or something like that. And that's called fine tuning. And once you have fine tuned uh, an instance of the model, you can then use that instance uh, in production to do predictions on, on new data. And this was really a transformative shift in the field of natural language processing. Uh, the modern type of language models started to come out in, at the end of 2017. As, and so what happened then was that Google released a new architecture of a neural network called the Transformer, which proved to be really applicable to the kind of language models that we are using. So language models have been around forever in language processing. But when you combine the language um, modeling objective with a transformer neural network architecture, that uh, gives you magic. Uh, that gives rise to a really powerful type of model. So before we had these transformer-based language models, we typically built uh, specific language processing solutions for each task, right? So if I'm interested in doing named entity recognition on Swedish, I build a specific pipeline for that, and then I start from scratch when I build another pipeline for sentiment analysis. But once we started to, to have these pre-trained models, we would base all of these applications on the same language model. And uh, so Robin up there is from uh, KB Lab, which was uh, one of the earliest um, organizations in Sweden that produced language models. Uh, and that has really transformed the way that we do language processing here in Sweden. So now we basically use one of the KB uh, models and, and do fine tuning on, on them. But <laughs> then something else happened at the summer of 2020. Um, something called GPT-3 came out, uh, and some of you have, have read about that, maybe even most of you. And that was a huge language model, uh, what we nowadays call LLM, large language model. Um, and not only was it a huge language model, it was also a language model of a slightly different type than the normal type of models that we used back in 2018. So uh, there is a shift around 2020, 2021, where we go from mid-sized language models to really large-scale language models. And we're also changing architecture, uh, or at least training objectives. So we're going from encoder type of models to decoder type of models, like GPT. Um, and a decoder is then a generative model. So it's trained specifically to generate language. Um, 
And the development that we've seen in the field uh, is, uh, is a, what we can call a scale race. So people are just building larger and larger models. Um, back in 2018, when BERT came out, which was one of the earliest language models from Google, it had 100 million parameters uh, of the neural network. The large version of BERT had 300 million parameters, and that was huge at the time. Then GPT-2 came out, I think it was like months later, it had more than 1 billion parameter uh, in the model. And then, of course, in the summer of 2020, uh, this is when GPT-3 came out uh, with 175 billion parameters in the model. Um, and that, um, many thought, was the end. Uh, we couldn't build larger models, but of course we could. So the development has just uh, continued since then. So the largest models that are available to date is the Megatron Turing model from NVIDIA here with 530 billion parameters and then the Pathways language model Palm from Google with 540 billion parameters. And these are dense transformer models. Uh, there are uh, sparse models with more parameters, but they are sparse then, right? Um, the latest models that we've seen, uh, Bloom here is an open source model um, bid specifically for African and Indian languages. Uh, it's a really interesting mix of languages. It has 176 billion parameters. Um, we have also seen an increase in the number of uh, size of the training data that we train these models on. So GPT-3 was trained on 300 billion tokens. That's a lot of text. Um, but then we also had a model from DeepMind coming out this year, which was trained on 1.4 trillion tokens. That's enormous amounts of data, right? So I would say at this point, when we think about building something like this for Swedish, we're sort of stuck in between two different directions here. One is just scaling up the model size. So stacking more layers and adding parameters, which is essentially what they did in GPT-3, or and uh, st uh, increasing the size of the training data, which is uh, what they have done in, in the Chinchilla model. Uh, and of course, we would like to do both of them, right? Uh, to build a model, huge model trained on vast amounts of data. Um, and of course, this is the reason why we're interested in, in scaling these models. It's not only because it's fun to, to you know, use supercomputers and, and, and uh, do multi-node training uh, over a, a super pod. But it's also because the models become better when you scale them up, when you scale up the data and the model size. Not only do they become better at specific tasks, they also become much more general. So we can use one model to solve lots of different problems without fine tuning by simply just utilizing the model's capacity. So this is the reason why we are interested in these models and why we want to build them for Swedish. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we're going to need uh, several different pieces of the puzzle. We're going to need to have a lot of data. We're going to need to have uh, good infrastructure to be able to train this, and also competence in how you actually uh, do this. So at AI Sweden, we have competence. We have a good uh, team with experts on, on natural language processing and language models. Um, but we don't really know how to do HPC computing. So we are teaming up uh, with NVIDIA uh, because they have the expertise in how to utilize their hardware stack. And uh, we're also working together with RISE and the natural language processing team there, and also with uh, the Wallenberg AI uh, program, WASP. In particular, the research arena for media and language, which is part of this uh, project. Okay, so one of the most challenging parts of, of doing this is to find enough data. So Swedish is a small language. We have limited amounts of speakers. Um, how do we actually find these huge resources of text data for Swedish? Well, we have the National Library, but it turns out their data is not available outside of the library, so we can't use that. So what we have done is uh, we have taken advantage of the fact that Swedish um, is typologically very similar to the other North Germanic languages. So we're training a Nordic language model. And if you look, so I'm a linguist by training, 
Uh, if you look at the dialectal variation in Swedish, you have dialects that are even closer to Norwegian than to Swedish, like Jämtländska, for example. So it sort of makes sense if we're interested in applications to train a Nordic language model. And it also gives us more data, of course. So um, we have tried to find open data sets in these languages. So we've taken uh, whatever is available. There is a common crawl, uh, there is something called the Oscar corpus, and these are all available um, corpora for these languages. We have also taken some data from uh, whatever open sources we have here in, in Sweden, like uh, Riksdagen, uh, dataportal.se to the extent that they have text. Uh, we have also used Elva uh, 77. Uh, and other weird APIs that we have found that can actually give us text, right? But so we end up with um, slightly more than one terabyte of data in total. Uh, and we cover all the North Germanic languages except for Faroese, because we haven't been able to find any data in Faroese. If you know of any Faroese data, please tell me. And this is so, sort of the distribution we end up with. Uh, once we, we do a lot of data processing, we clean the data, we filter data, we do deduplication, normalization, etc. Uh, so our, our training data set consists primarily of, of Swedish. We also have a fair amount of English in there because it's high quality and we are interested in seeing if we can get transfer effects from our, our English task related data to the Nordic languages. Uh, we have Norwegian, Danish, a little bit of Icelandic, everything that we could find. And we also have code in the data. So we have Python code and uh, well, I think we chose like four programming languages. Just because we're interested to see if the model will be able to code uh, when we're done with it. So we're going to end up somewhere there when it comes to training tokens for gpt uh, which is uh, big enough to train a really big model. Uh, and the next challenge is compute. Uh, so we're working together with the research arena of media and language in, in, in the WASP program, and that gives us access to Berzelius. Um, and we have been really happy with this collaboration so far. So I think currently we're training on 20 nodes. So uh, Berzelius currently have 60 nodes, GGX nodes. Um, they might extend that, which we hope for. So 20 nodes is on the small end of uh, the type of models that we want to train. Uh, we would like to train on 60 nodes, but then a lot of other researchers in Sweden would be sad. So, But we're hoping to at least have 30 nodes for the big uh, models. And these are uh, the model sizes that we are training and have been training uh, for, for this model. Um, so some of these columns have other uh, colors. So this is our current model that we are use, using uh, in-house at AI Sweden. It has 6.7 billion parameters. Um, we have also trained uh, two preliminary models, like a 5 uh, billion parameter model that uh, had an artifact in the tokenization scheme. So we're uh, discontinuing that model. Um, and we also trained the 3.5 billion parameter model last year, which was an initial test to see if we could utilize Berzelius, uh, and we could. And then we have two very tiny models uh, because we're interested in, in scaling behavior, what happens when we scale these models. And currently we're running this job on Berzelius, 20 billion parameter model. Uh, it's, uh, I, so this morning, the, law, the validation loss has exceeded our previous model. So this is now our best model. Uh, but it's still training, so it's going to be done in maybe two or three weeks' time. And then we're starting this job, the 40B model, uh, that will take two months, something, on 20 nodes, we think. And then we're going to start this model, the 175 billion one, and that's going to take half a year or something on Berzelius. Uh, so with any luck, it should be ready until next summer. And if you look at what other people are doing internationally, there are some compilations of the large language models of the world. This one is um, compiled and um, hosted by Stella uh, from Eleuther. Eleuther is an open source uh, research initiative that are training models. Um, what's interesting to note is that our preliminary model is on place 36 currently on this list. So our uh, we are up here now with our 7B model. 
I, what is interesting is if you look at the languages, we are the only small language on this list. And once we have trained the large model, we're going to be up there with the major languages of the world. And I think that's quite nice. Uh, from a linguistic sovereignty perspective, I think this is an is a interesting thing to do. Okay, so why are we doing this? Well, it's fun to use Berzelius and to learn how to do these large-scale things, and it, we build competence in Sweden, of course, by doing this, but we are primarily interested in the use of these models. So we have this hypothesis, and what we've seen in international research is that they seem to be very general and really powerful for solving generic language processing tasks. Is that the case also for our models? So we have started a validation project uh, funded by Venova. Uh, started it like a couple of weeks ago, and it's going to uh, go for two years. And the purpose of this project is to validate whether we can actually use these type of foundation models to solve real-world tasks in, in Sweden. Is this the way forward for language processing? Uh, or maybe it is not. Maybe it's just a fun thing to do and it gives us good chatbots, but it might not be useful for actual applications. I mean, we're going to find out. And the way that we are uh, structuring this project is we're First of all, we're training the models and we hope to distribute them as open source. Um, there are some challenges with that when it comes to licensing these type of generative high performance models, but we hope to solve that um, with the responsible AI license. Um, but for the big models, the 175B model, that's not going to be it's going to be challenging just to run inference on that. We currently think that it's going to require four DGX machines just to do inference on that model. So we're going to um, figure out a way to host that model uh, centrally and to open an API for, for that model, sort of the way that GPT-3 is, is working right now. So we also want to explore whether that sort of um, paradigm will be useful in Sweden. Can people actually send data to an API? That's not clear, and we know in certain cases it will not be possible. So we, we have actors from all, uh, all sectors uh, involved in this project, both from private sector, small and large companies. We have uh, public sector, a number of organizations, and also RISE is uh, involved as our research partner here. So uh, with, uh, now you can't actually see, it's a picture of the Baltic region here with Sweden and the Baltic countries down here. So uh, it's not like we're megalomaniacs and think we're going to take over the world, but we're interested in, uh, can we collaborate on this also in the Nordic region and build more powerful models based on data from all of the different countries um, and host that in some centralized way? Is, is that a way to sort of proceed? I think I'm going to stop there. Okay.